Good evening, good night, good morning, wherever you're watching my transmission. It is I, Mike Martins. People, I'll leave a link below to my streaming channel now. I'm going to be streaming on another channel, but I'll still be uploading videos here on a daily basis, by daily basis, uploading uh, videos and stuff. Um, my video was taken down. I had, okay, so I have a total of 111 videos taken down now so far, and a majority of our tar are targeting the Australian housing market for some reason. I don't know why. Um, I don't know why it's just specifically those videos are being attacked. So I want to make a video up for the live stream that was taken down and all the other videos that have been taken down. So guys, right here, I'm not lying to you. So my live streaming has been disabled. They've taken it off off because people were calling into the show, giving us a heads up on what's going on. And there's nothing better than intelligence. So I'll leave a link below in this video uh, so you can subscribe to our li my live stream. It's an old video game channel I have. So it's still up and it still does live streaming. So we'll do it from there. So anyways, I got a really, really good show for you guys that are watching tonight. I have this couple of articles. Uh, some of them from 10, uh, 10, 11, 12 years ago. That I found, and they're pretty good. They're really good written articles. Um, I found this from Australia and housing, how the housing situation, how the the media worded things or or told people, or how the media kind of made people believe or made people, yeah, it's just what, yeah, yeah. Australian Australian resident. This is from. It's called economic factors affecting the Australian housing market. The article is from the 19th, Monday, 19th of March, 2007. Australia, Australian residential property prices have shown remarkable resilience despite the end of the boom in most major cities around three years ago. Under the influence and mineral boom, property prices in Perth, Darwin, and some other centers such as McKay have continued to rise rapidly, at least up until the end of 2006. That's when a, bu a bunch of Aboriginal workers were left in the cold, basically, after that boom busted there. But in most parts of southeastern Australia, with the uh, exception of western Sydney, the stellar price increases chalked up between the mid-90s and the early years of this decade not have been reserved. And indeed, in some cities, property prices have continued to rise. A belt El, El beat at more modest rates. It's probably an Australian word. To a very large extent, the, the rise in Australian property prices over the past dozen or so years is a result of a number of favorable developments from a standpoint of would be home buyers. Being capitalized into prices, foremost among these is a course of dramatic decline in interest rates and Australian transitioned from the high and volatile inflation of the 1970s and 1980s to the low and stable inflation we have enjoyed since the mid-1990s. So now they're lowering rates here, according to what this article is saying. This has been supplemented by enhanced competition in mortgage markets which has seen mortgage rates fall by more than the official cash rate. The borrowing capacity of home buyers has also been assisted by 15 years of rising real, real, uh, rising real incomes, in contrast to the decline in real incomes over the, as much as 1980s. The combined effect of these trends has been to lift the amount which two earner household on average earnings can afford to borrow without debt servicing, absorbing more than a quarter of their income from around $100,000 in the early 1990s to over $300,000 today. And a financial innovation has meant that this rule of thumb for determining the maximum loan size is less binding constraint than it used to be. Over the same period, however, Net additions to the housing stock are about 1.25 million, 
were sufficient only to absorb the increase in the number of households requiring accommodation. Thanks to the rising net immigration and decline in the average number of people per household. That's a huge problem too. So although the borrowing capacity of buyers has more than uh, uh, trebled over the past 15 years, there has to be no net increase in the supply of housing. In these circumstances, it is hardly surprising that the price of housing has roughly doubled. And now that the structural decline in interest rates between 1990 and 2002 has clearly come to an end. So interest rates decline have come to an end and been more or less fully capitalized into the value of the existing housing stock. House prices in general rising at much more subdued pace. Suggestions that because houses are now overvalued relative to incomes or rents. So this is back in 2007. What the hell was this? 2007 in March. So they're already already um, forecasting this back in the day and saying that this is not normal, right? Now are overvalued relative uh, to income or rents. Therefore, a uh, law of gravity will inevitably result in the fall of house prices in much the same way o as overvalued share prices inevitably decline. Ignore a fundamental difference between the shares and residential real estate. Although equities have or uh, over long periods of time typically been at least as rewarding as an investment as real estate. No one has to own shares if shares are widely perceived to be overvalued. Enough investors will reduce their exposure to shares. This is a sell item to push the, their prices down the levels which will eventually be priced as ferity or undervalued. On the other hand, we all have to live somewhere. So that's the key, right? And that's what they're trying to sell people nowadays with this whole FOMO thing. And in Australia, we generally prefer to live in our own dwelling rather than someone else's if we can. So it's the pride of owning a home, right? Very few Australians are ever going to respond to being told that their property is overvalued. By shorting the property market, that is, by selling their resistance, renting for a while, and hoping to re-enter the housing market at a lower price, the transaction costs as well as Personal inconvenience represent major barriers to anyone contemplating doing their, how, their house what Carrie Packer did in Channel 9 at Alan Bond's expense. I don't know what that is, but that's okay. So when the house prices do reach a level at which marginal would-be buyer can no longer afford to buy, its turnover drops by 28% over the past three years. Rather than prices rather than prices. Prices do not fall across the board unless interest rates and or unemployment start rising and amounts of sufficient uh, to force some existing owners to become sellers. So all of this is happening right now. Heck, they haven't even really raised interest. I think it was like a, a teensy beansy little, a little sprinkle of pixie dust to raise a little bit, just a little bit of that flower, get that dough going up and boom. You started to see what's happening in, in Australia. That has happened in some pockets, such as Western Sydney, where it would appear that some people who borrowed a very subs a substantial, uh, substantial portion of their purchase price at the through, uh, through tro, wow, tro of the interest rate cycle. It doesn't say through. Ah, oh, they spell through differently. Oh, okay. Through the interest rate cycle and who made very little, if any, allowance for the possibility that rates could rise even by percentage point. So they were even worried that if even rates back then went up by a percentage point. Wow. Or so have found themselves unable to maintain their mortgage commitments. By, uh, But these are exceptions rather than the rule. 
And in the more affluent suburbs of Australia and larger cities, rising incomes and share values have boosted the capacity of buyers to purchase residences, residences whose value is enhanced by their scarcity. So people could buy for more because they're making more, right? Technically, right? Buoyant by rising immigration, underlying demand for housing is now running around 165,000 units per annum. But current levels of housing starts dampening by the rise of interest rates over the past few years imply that net expansion in the housing stock of less than 140,000 units per annum. Not surprisingly, rental vacancy rates are declining sharply and will likely be down around 1% in most cities. Wow. So that's the rental uh, vacancy rate. A prospect which is certain to prompt acceleration in rents. A key lesson for those concerned about improving housing affordability. Okay, guys, here goes. Whether for buyers or renters is that policies which work only on the demand side of the housing market are doomed to fail. Thank you. Anything which puts additional cash in the hands of buyers, such as grants or stamp duty uh, concessions, or renters such as cash assistance, with the view of enabling them to buy or rent more expensive houses, results merely in more expensive houses. Instead, policy needs to focus on increasing supply of housing, particularly low-cost housing, and reducing the time taken to bring land and housing to market. So I wanted to read this for you guys because this is a really good article, and it kind of touches on, it hints upon a little bit of the future here. So that article is called Economic Factors Affecting the Housing Market. It was published on Monday, the 19th of March, two. 2007 let's move on oh my god sydney median house price five hundred and five thousand dollars when was this people this was the 22nd of february 2005 at 12 36 in the morning sydney's property market remains resilient despite the sales numbers falling sharply over 2004 new um, figures show the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales said while a volume of Sydney property sales in late 2004 was significantly down on late 2003, prices remained steady. The REI president, Rowan Kelly, uh, said the number of houses sold in New South Wales dropped more than 30% in the December quarter of 2004 compared to the same period in 2003. And over the same three months were almost 50% fewer unit sales comparatively. REI figures show the median price for of a house in Sydney during the last three months in 2004 was 505000 a 1% increase from the previous quarter. The median sale price of a unit in Sydney remained steady at $370,000. In New South Wales, overall, the median house price increased slightly over a quarter up 1.3% to 390,000 while the medium unit price fell 2.86% to 340,000. Now, why did I bring this article up? I brought it up for a good reason. Because I did this whole payment calculation thing and with the stress testing that's happening now and for a person an a so the average uh, let's say the average median income, let's say is $90,000. If your median income net, I don't care what you make gross, whatever you give to your government is your is your is your problem, but ninety thousand dollars net falls in and around three hundred and ninety thousand dollars at three point five percent interest. Okay, so if rates go up, there is a small aggregation on there. So on three hundred and ninety thousand uh, dollars, so you're paying three six nine. 12 so you're paying about 12,000 a year in finance charges so if you have an interest only loan on 390 you're paying 12 13 thousand dollars 14 maybe with fees and all stuff about 14 thousand a year which is which is really good you know what I'm saying so right now it, it, it's just phenomenal if they have to raise interest rates in in Australia which I think they need to do they're in for a, a, 
really rough roller coaster ride. And I know prices are dropping there like a rock. Especially now that they introduced, uh, they want to add to their books a portion of the product. They want to add 30% interest only uh, products now. 30% of their, I guess, what's out there or what's lent out by the banks, they're allowing 30%. A watchdog, a bank watchdog said, hey, we're going to let 30% uh, – uh, you know, we're going to let 30% ro- uh, of your books be uh, interest only. Horrible. Why Australia has the world's most expensive homes. So this article is from... Oh, this is from a year before that one. So this is from 13th of November, 2007. The other article is from 2008. Australia is now the world leader of unaffordable housing. So it goes way back to 2007. And none of the major parties are tackling the core reasons. Ben uh, Schneider's, Schneider's, Schneider's reveal how other countries deal with housing dilemma. Jody Koch has made a decision. She'll skip the mortgage opt of the housing market and rent for now. Koch, 32, is struggling uh, average earner. She has a professional job in the market, earns an average income and has a budget of 350000 yet she can't afford to buy a two-bedroom flat she wants. As recently as seven years ago, Coach's budget would have been uh, bought her a two-medium-priced two two medium priced two-bedroom flats in St. Kilda, where she lives, and would like to buy today. Her budget doesn't even buy her one flat. With the average apartments in inner, inner Melbourne, now selling for more than 400000 Okay, here, this is important, guys. A survey by consultants, uh, Demographia, Demographia, don't, de- Demographia, released this year, found that Australians paid 6.6 times the median household income for a medium-priced home. In New Zealand, Ireland, and Britain, medium-priced home cost between 5.5 and 6 times the median yearly income. So 6.6 times in Australia. And that was, th- that was, that was in, in 2000, when, when was this? 2012, was it? 2007. So now, what is it? 17 times? Well, you know what? Factor in all the food and everything and then all the other bills you have and see how much you have left over. Wow. I think people are putting, what, 60, 70% of their, their income towards, uh, towards housing now in Australia and some major cities, I'm saying. Same thing in Vancouver, Toronto. Uh, New Zealand, Ireland, Britain, medium home price costs between 5.5 and 6 times the median yearly household income. In the U.S. and Canada, it was beaten 3 or 4 times. An affordable market is regarded as about 3 times income. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Here we go. An affordable market is regarded as about three times your income. This is this is one hundred percent spot on. Economists point out that the past decade has seen affordability decline in most of the developed world. One reason is sustained worldwide economic expansion, says ANZ chief economist Saul Eslake. We are living in what is the strongest period in the above trend growth the world has seen for about 30 years growth combined with steep falls in interest rates in the 1990s and easier access to finance has meant the surge in house prices yet despite the worldwide trends things are worse in australia experts point to a number of reasons so they're gonna get political stuff and then let's go back to here in the united states most of housing policy was done at a local level with the planning uh, system often used to encourage affordable developments. But the U.S. federal government also p- plays a role since 1934 has guaranteed mortgages at a low cost. In Australia, investment in housing helped by tax incentives is dominated by a small landlord class that is largely unique to this country. And the side effects is absence of a large industrial Uh, investor in rental housing. Bigger investors could provide stability of ownership, targeted projects, and allow longer-term tenure. 
Another issue rarely discussed is immigration. Australia, for its population size, has one of the largest immigration populations in the world, adding to demand for housing, combined with a development sector that is building enough houses. The sector says this is due to excessive taxes and charges, as well as rest restrictive land policies. There is now a fear that the lack of building is creating housing shortages. So this is very, very, very... Uh, let's go to the closing argument. Saul does not feel there will be an improvement anytime soon, short of an economic downturn that pushes prices lower. He suspects there is not much punch political that will tackle the problem. Few of 70% of the population that owns a house or has a mortgage will look kindly upon the political party moving to push down prices. So a lot of people that do own don't want to see prices go down too, right? But then you got that affordability level where you start bridging a gap and then you got the young couples and you got people dying and inheriting properties. Everything starts to change. You know, things change. They don't, you know. Australia has the biggest homes in the world. Recession sh uh, shrinks U.S. houses. So average size of new homes across the globe. Australia is the biggest. I think it's 214. I think it's square meters. Then it's the United States, 201. New Zealand, 196. Denmark, Greece. Where the hell is Canada in this thing? Hey, Portugal's there. Where's Canada? Average size of new homes across the globe. Wow. So Australia's got the, according to this thing, the biggest homes. Increasingly, though, increasingly, though the number of inhabitants appeared to be rising. Back in 1911, when Australia completed its first census, there were 4.5, uh, I guess, million people. In, oh, 4.5 people in each house. But almost a century later, it's nearly half to 2.4 persons. Yet, this might be now trending upwards, as ABS estimates for 2007-2008, 2.56 persons per home. So, it's very interesting. It's an old, very old article, but it's interesting to read some of this stuff. So, if the housing trend continues, looks like we stand a good chance of also retaining that crown of the world's best carbon emitters. Oh well, if the if if the possible funding for the Olympic athletes uh, eventuates, maybe the nation can focus on focus instead on being world champion of energy. Wow. Ooh, that's a nice house. Anyways, let's move on. The Great Australian Housing Bubble. So this article is from September 27, 2010. There is currently a widespread debate in Australia and abroad over whether Australia is experiencing an unsustainable housing bubble or asset inflation based upon sound fundamentals. This is a very good, good graph here. The, bl bl the below chart uh, plots Australia's normal housing price growth against uh, comparable countries. As you can see, Australia's house price growth has been nothing short of phenomenal, leaving the other countries in its wake. And that's why I've been, I've been, I've been covering Australia for so many years now. Here it is. USA, New Zealand, United Kingdom, and Australia. Holy crap, yeah, look at that. Just kaboom. Next, I have plotted the average Australian established house prices against uh, average household disposable income, uh, full-time ordinary earnings. So, guys, this is very important. There's disposable income because wages go up and everything over time. So it stays in check with, uh, with and then the average full-time earner. So there's disposable income there's the average full-time earner and there's the ratio right there as you can see the ratio of house prices to average earnings started around 2.5 times hdi and 3.7 times aftoe in 1986 the ratio inc increased slowly from the mid 1980s to 2000 rose rapidly from 2000 to around 2004 and then settled around six times hdi 7.7 .7 times so it's like six times the increased cost of housing has also reflected the amount of hdi required to service the amount of of uh the average mortgage so the disposable income 
HDI, uh, housing disposable, household disposable income, hasn't been in check. So people are using their homes, the equity of the growth, to eat. Plain and simple. Or to buy a Jaguar. Yeah, Jaguar. Home prices in biggest drop in 12 years. So we get to 2011, April 23rd. Capital City Homes continued their downward slide in March, posting their worst slump in at least 12 years. At the property market showed signs of staggering demand. Brisbane and Perth fell the most. So this is during the after. This is way after the, the mining slump, right? National City Home Value slipped 0.2% seasonally adjusted in March following a downward down worldly revised 0.5% fall in February. According to the property research group RP Data, rise mark the decline brought the national city medium dwelling price to 455,000 in March. So remember the other article we read, it just reached 401, now it's at 455. In the March quarter alone, city, uh, city home prices sank 2.1%. The group said that that's the biggest decline. An RP risk marks data series began June quarter of 1999. Basically, there are more people putting their properties on the market than there are people buying them. So get, obviously, it's not a supply issue, right? RP data research indicator Tim Lawless told Business uh, Business Day, until we start to see that effect of supply being absorbed, I really don't think we'll see any upward prices and pressure. So this, now pay attention guys, 2011, tail end into 2012 is when um, you start seeing a lot of foreign investing starting to kick off. It started in Vancouver during the Olympics in 2010. A lot of foreign investing coming in. And then Sydney started to become uh, a heavy, heavy uh, destination around tail end of 2011 when it got really strong. And it was right there around that time when housing prices started to dip. And this is when a lot of foreign investors jumped onto the market there, like big time. And this is when a lot of investors wanted to get their money out of China. And back then, there wasn't a lot of um, uh, capital outflow restrictions, right? So other recent reports points to weaknesses in the real estate market property data. So earlier this month, the stock of houses and units in the market has increased, rising 45.5%. To the year of March, 356,000 properties nationwide. Wow. So you're starting to see this is when this is right here. This is the era of when foreign investing really started to take off around the tail end of 2011 because prices look like they were a good time to jump on, right? Let's see where we are here. I read that one. House versus kids. Which one comes first? Two families share their experiences. So, again, this article. Uh, my kids are crying. So, this is a story. It's an interesting story here about uh, house or kids. Uh, affordability, affordability levels we could see. I'm looking for the date here. Ah, here, November 16, 2012. The Australian proper is having a really tough time having families. They have to choose between a house or they have to choose between having a family because uh, it's really tough to have both. So that's a huge problem. And you can start seeing it developing in uh, early stages of 2012 here. And then housing shortage uh, threatens living standards and economic growth. So now they're playing the housing shortage card again. And this is in December 21st, 2011. So this is the end of 2011. Australia's housing crisis has worsened with a shortfall of 186,000 dwellings, prompting war warnings of a slump in living standards and economic prosperity. In the latest report, the National Housing Supply Council found the gap between housing and supply and demand widened by 28,000 dwellings in just 12 months. The shortfall projected to blow out 640,000 units within 20 years, placing a massive pressure on social housing and lower-end rental markets. 
So right here, they're starting to play the supply versus demand issue, right? And I, I kind of believe it a bit here. Uh, I kind of believe um, what they're saying here in this article. But the government's uh, national rental affordability scheme worth $4.3 billion has funded the development to 4,603 low-rent dwellings so from the target of 50,000. So you could see that supply versus uh, they're calling a supply and demand issue right now. And that is becoming a massive problem in Australia. So here's a couple of little tidbits I wanted to show you guys on the housing uh, housing and what they saw back in the early 2000s and the late uh Sorry, late 2006s and 7s and how things formed and started creating this. I think it has a lot to do with the foreign investing that came in around that 2011-2012 uh, era. Um, and then 1 million homes left empty across Australia. And this is it. Australia has 200,000 more homes sitting empty than it had a decade ago. New figure show. Despite the country's grappling with housing supply shortage that is pushing the cost of the first home beyond many of its residents. So 2016 census described cruel and immoral by lending UNSW urban policy expert Hal Pawson has warned the government must act to stem the growth in unoccupied housing. So this unoccupied housing created shortages and artificial bubbles. The mystery of the 1 million uh, homes empty... One in 10 Australian dwellings are empty and uh, vacancy tax won't solve the problem. So this is another major issue. The amount of dwell empty dwellings unoccupied, a total of 1,089,000 ghost cities and shells. Economy slowing, Sydneyers moving and towers shooting up. So a lot of people in Sydney, this article actually is from uh, a new one. It's from July, 2018. But a lot of condos going up in Sydney, I don't think that's going to solve the problem. An empty homes rate in Australia almost the same as 1986 new report finds. So that's that. I kind of wanted to share this with you guys. Vacant homes are a global epidemic in Paris, and they're fighting it with the 60% tax. I bring this up in, in every one of my videos. If people can uh, empower or people in this situation empower, that could pass laws runaway real estate speculation has filing global cities with vacant homes creating artificial shortages in the world's most significant sought off sought off cities the shortage has made local homeowners wealthy overnight but it comes at a cost of turning lively cities into empty shells the city of paris has decided it has had enough and implementing a tax in 2015 they didn't they didn't get the results they wanted so they tripled it to 60 percent so there it is vacant homes and Sydney's right here, 118,000, just in Sydney. And then there's New York City, and then there's all the other major cities. Okay, I'm going to check on my family and my kids and see what they're up to, because it sounds like my daughter and my son are getting into it. That's what happens when you have a family. Thanks for watching, guys, and let me know what you guys, what you guys think.